Well, good morning, First Christian Church. Good to see all the smiling faces here, and I know there's lots of them at home. So, hey, I know you're smiling under that mascot, so... <laughs> So welcome. It's a beautiful, beautiful spring morning. Um, if you haven't looked at, been outside in that, it's a gorgeous day to, to check it out. It's warm and sunny. Um, and that, so, so happy Palm Sunday. So this is our day before Easter. Um, traditionally, that's the, um, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem and they laid down palm branches and that on, on the road as he rode into Jerusalem. So um, so, it's, so it's our Palm Sunday celebration. We are going to be have some special um, guest speakers today and, and a video, so I'll let you wait on that and see what, what, um, what surprises we have. Um, other announcements real quick, and then I'm going to read a scripture. Um, um, my Zoom 2.0 group on Wednesday nights is going to continue. Um, we're doing a two-part series on, on studying the Bible um, in that, so we will do that this week on Wednesday. And I believe Scott's um, Wednesday group is going to be starting up the week after Easter on Wednesday at 6. So, so that's coming up as well. Um, so a couple of things. And then most importantly, um, as most of you know, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. You believe it? It's here already. We should have gorgeous weather. It should be a beautiful day. So encourage you to, um, to take part if you can come here and and. and in, enjoy our service in person. We would sure welcome you to come. We're going to be doing lots of pre, um, extra precautions to make sure it's safe. Um, but again, make sure you make the decision about what's safe for you guys. Um, but it should be a great Easter service. We're going to have a few special things for the kids, um, as well as, as some special Easter um, activities here. So that is next Sunday. So we'll join us in our reopening Sunday, I think is what we're calling it. Something like that. So, <clears throat> anyway. All right, let's, um, I wanted to read real quick a passage out of Colossians um, that God kind of sh shared with me this week, and I thought it was good. And it just, it deals with, um, you know, our ab ability to share our words with the people around us. What kind of words do we share? So this is Colossians 4, um, and Paul is talking here to the church, but he's also talking to us, and he, let me get it over here, and he says, um, you know, devote yourselves to prayer, be alert with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us, Paul, that God may open to us the door so that the word may, I may speak forth the mystery of Christ that I've been set to do, in order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And then he talks to really to us and he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of your opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. And for me, it was just a reminder that, you know, the words we share are important, and they send a message to people, whether we intended it or not, and that. And so take the opportunity to share words of grace um, in that this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, um, this great two weeks of celebration of Palm Sunday today and Easter Sunday next Sunday where we get to celebrate the resurrection of your, of your son Jesus, Father. What a beautiful picture. It's the cornerstone of, of our Christian faith. So, Father, help us this week as we, as we go about and we interact with people to have encouraging words, inviting words, grace-filled words, Father. So guide us in that. Help us to be... Um, able to share um, your love with those around us with, with the words we share. So bless our service now. We pray for your presence to fill this place. And thank you for being with us, and thank you for this Easter season. In Jesus' name, amen. So get your communion supplies ready, and I think Robert's going to come up and share our communion time. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful day out there. I believe that everyone from the strongest, weakest, biggest, smallest is born with a purpose. We all have a destiny. In the Bible, there are many stories of good situations, and in our lives, good things happen. 
also happen. But sometimes we can work against ourselves. All sorts of things such as addictions, self-centeredness, drinking, isolation, stress. There are a lot more, but not all, not all setbacks have to be self-inflicted. In the Bible, there's a story that comes to mind for me. It's the story of Joseph. The Lord allowed his brothers to throw him into a pit. Talk about a setback. But another word for setback we can use in this situation is detour. He was stuck. Sometimes God allows things to be out of control. We learned that we never had control in the first place. I believe God uses detours in our lives to bring, to bring about his blessing to deliver you to the place he has created just he created a place just for you and the story of joseph is a book of redemption redemptive redemptive and forgiveness i know for me i have a lot holding me back from being the man that god wants me to be this morning i want to take some time to look at our own lives on a personal level are there something we can be doing better? Is something holding us back? Hold up. I would say we've all experienced a big detour with the COVID. My heart goes out to the lives lost and the businesses lost this, over this past. No matter how you feel about the virus, it has changed the way that we live. No doubt about it. But it's out of our, and it's out of our control. But do we all know someone who can control it? And I couldn't decide on which verse to read, so I got two verses. Romans eight eighteen. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are a great master, worthy of all praise. I must confess that I am judgmental at times. Thank you for your grace and forgiveness. I pray with all the humility I have to give up my will. And I pray for your will in my life in all situations. In Jesus' name, so be it. Communion. So we'll take our communion tab, um, items. And we realize that communion was illustrated by Christ himself. And he said, take this and eat my body. Drink all of this, for this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you. Go on. Well, that was awesome. Good job, Taylor. There were some big words in there. You managed it. That was awesome. That was our awesome Taylor going on there. Robert, I didn't mean to laugh, but that, the, that was how my whole week has gone this week. And I think it's uh, indicative of missionary work, which we're kind of, we're in the middle of a two-part series on missions. So it's kind of appropriate to have everything kind of scattered because the thing about being on mission somewhere in the world even if that somewhere is pleasant hill is it's just messy and you got to be flexible you got to go with the flow and you got to remember the purpose of what you're doing is jesus so this morning is palm sunday which is a a wonderful very meaningful um, day in history the day that jesus rode into jerusalem for that final week that holy week leading up to um, his crucifixion and resurrection. I did want to mention I left some contact cards out there, and we're going to hear from a couple of missionaries today 
Um, we have uh, a family here, and we also have a recording that a friend of mine made in Guatemala um, to, sh to show. So, especially you young people, but even you old people, at the end of the service, we're going to have someone come around and collect cards and put them in a gallon Ziploc and, and seal them. But we'd like you, if you are interested, I'd love for you to write a little note of encouragement to um, any of the missionaries you feel like, or just a note of encouragement to anybody. And um, maybe if you are an artist, you could draw a little picture on the contact card too, but mostly, uh, that got your attention, huh, Amelia? Mostly, um, I'm just looking for, it'd be fun to be able to hand this bag of encouragement cards to the missionary family that we have here um, this morning, and then in a week or two when they know COVID's dead on the card so they can just open it up and be encouraged, <laughs> which would be great, right? A memory then. So be encouraged to do that. So Palm Sunday, what is it? You know, if you haven't really ever encountered Palm Sunday before, Palm Sunday, like I said, is that day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. A lot of meaning there because they're shouting, uh, Hosanna in the highest. And we'll talk about that word a little later. They're recognizing Jesus as Lord and king, right? Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And you see this moment captured in all four gospels in the Bible. And what's interesting is all four of them give different parts of it because it's four people remembering that morning and writing down what they remember or what was important to them to have written down. So it's really fun. I would really encourage you if you want to really get into Palm Sunday. When you go home tonight, find the triumphal entry. That's what it is in all four Gospels. And read the accounts and see, see if it gives you a, a bigger picture of what was going on that morning. But there's also a lot of Jewish things going on, this, on that morning as well. For instance, Passover is coming up on, on that Friday. And so Passover uh, was a celebration to remember when the angel of death passed over the Israelites when they were in Egypt, right before they left Egypt and started their wandering. Um, and so God commanded that every year that um, us fathers especially would teach our children to remember that um, beautiful work that God did. And he instituted it as a, as a celebration we were to celebrate. And one of the things you do for Passover, that was the Last Supper, it was actually a Passover meal, is you would choose a lamb. And I said this, I think, well, has it been two years now? Because we couldn't do Easter and everything last year. Anyway, they, they would choose the lamb five days before um, Passover because they wanted the lamb to live with the kids and be taken care of with, um, by the children and the parents. And you know, those little lambs are super cute, right? So you fall in love with them and everything, and then you have to sacrifice them for your meal and sacrifice by putting your, praying your sins into them. This is the old way of doing things and then and slaughtering that lamb. And so they wanted people to, God wanted us to feel the pain of our sin, that it was something important and specific. And so what's really interesting is Jesus is entering the gates of Jerusalem as the Jewish people, because it's five days before Passover, are selecting their Passover lambs. And so Jesus, in many ways, is offering himself as a Passover lamb. And, of course, he's known as the Lamb of God, right? And so that's also really interesting. But also, you know, we celebrate today just like they celebrated back then. We're just not standing up outside of the, of the, the gates of the city, and we don't have palm fronds this Sunday um, because, you know, with COVID rules, you're not supposed to be transferring things you touch. So we didn't do palm fronds this year. And, um, but what we do is we gather to commemorate that our Lord and our King has come. And we gather to say, at least internally, if not together as a family, that blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So we're really doing the same thing that was going on that day 2,000 plus years ago, where we're recognizing Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we're shouting that out in spiritual ways, but we're also indicating that by being here. This is by far the biggest day I've seen in attendance since we reopened in person. 
And so you, by doing that, it's not about the numbers. It's that you're saying, this is a day that's so important. I have to be in fellowship with my family. It's important for me to be at church. Though, remember, we talked about last week, you are the church. This is just a building. This is the, the missionary uh, outpost, if you will. But you want it to be together with people because it's important, just like they were all together outside of the gates of Jerusalem that long past that first Passover so long ago. And then the other thing I wanted just to mention briefly is that you got to think about what was going on then. Because Jesus came into town and people came in for Passover, and we come to church, or we come in here this morning into this room or onto the live feed, wherever you are in the world, and we are all coming in, but the goal of this is to go out, right? Jesus knew what was coming. It was not going to be a good week for him. He weeps. I'm going to read this in a minute. He weeps during this moment of celebration. He knows what's coming. He ends up crying tears of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane a few days later because he's afraid, right? Um, so there's a lot going on. It's like this bittersweet moment. But he was going into the city so that he could complete his work, crucified, die, resurrect, and then go out into the world and send his people out. Those people, those Jews... Uh, or the beginning Christians, I guess it's kind of hard to tell at that moment, right? These people that are recognizing him as Lord, it, they would come in, fulfill their duties of Passover, eat the meal that Friday night, and then they would leave Jerusalem. So I have a friend that's a rabbi in Manhattan, or was, and he ha rabbis have to be inside the, the walls of Jerusalem twice a year, and Passover is one of those things, one of those times. So if you're a rabbi and you want to continue being a rabbi, it's required you be in the city walls every year during Passover and another time. And so that's the same thing that's going on today. Everybody's going into the city. They're celebrating Passover together. They're fellowshipping. They're, they're remembering this great thing God did, a lot of partying, appropriate partying, and um, just a lot of really celebration going on. And then they went out back to their villages, back to their homes. We're going to do the same thing after service today. So it's, it's much like what's going on now was going on back then. I want to read you, um, since we're reading through the Gospel of Luke, I thought it would be appropriate to look at Luke's um, account of the triumphant entry way out in, in chapter 19. And so I'm going to read uh, Luke 19, verses 37 through 44. And Luke has, is recording, as soon as Jesus was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, that's the, the canyon there or the valley before you go up to Jerusalem, the whole crowd of the disciples, that's everybody, not just the apostles, everybody, when they say disciples, began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So Luke records that a little different than, than Matthew does. He remembers uh, more words being said. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Kind of an echo of Jesus' birth, right? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, Hey, I tell you, if these, if these guys become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached Jerusalem... In the celebration, right, in this mode, everybody's like, wow, oh, he's the king, and Jesus is coming in, and, and uh, you know, all this is going on, his reaction. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, and he wept over it. Jesus, the celebrated Savior, walking into Jerusalem, crying. And he says, if you had known in this day, even you, if you had known the things which make for peace... But now they've been hidden from your eyes. The Pharisees, the people coming to him. Robert Davis made an awesome comment on our devotional, I think yesterday morning, it really struck me, where the Pharisees were saying, only God can do these things. And Robert's like, I wonder if Jesus was like, yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. But, you know, they never get it, right? They just never get it. And so he's weeping over that. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. 
For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in one stone even on top of another because you did not recognize the time of visitation. And he's talking, in my opinion, about what's going to happen in about 37 years when Rome finally has enough of the Jews when you have these uh, Hasmoneans, these uh, Jewish terrorists, really, going after Rome and just you know, slicing up Romans everywhere, trying to cause an uprising of the Jews. Rome finally gets tired of it and says, I'm done. I'm not putting up with this anymore. Go in there and destroy Jerusalem. Level the temple to the ground. And they did. Don't leave another stone on top of another. They didn't. You can go to Jerusalem apparently now and stand up on the Temple Mount and on one side there's still giant blocks of, of stone that, it, that were pushed over the edge to tumble down into a pile. And that's fulfilling this prophecy very clearly. And, he was, and Jesus is weeping about this. If you just would follow the way of Christ, if you would just follow the way of peace, if you would just love one another, you know, love God and love one another, man. This would be amazing. This is what, we're, what God is all about. This is the whole word of God. And yet, we don't do that. And we don't do that, really, even to this day, right? I was looking around, and, and this verse in Philippians on the next slide really, really hit me. It's Paul. It's not Jesus. But Paul is saying... Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It struck me because I was thinking about Jesus weeping, and I thought, this is probably him, too. He's working out your salvation, my salvation with fear and trembling. We like to think that, I think there's a part of us that want to think that, you know, this was great for Jesus. It just was all according to his plan. Everything worked out according to his plan, so that was great. That's true, but that didn't make it easy. You're in this room today and a follower of Jesus because God worked that out as part of his plan. He had called you, he had been he predestined you before you were even born, right? Which just means he knew ahead of time to be a follower of his. But that doesn't mean your following of him has been all that easy. <laughs> and sometimes it's probably been a little difficult. And so that's what struck me here is, is Jesus also, or is Paul in this case, I guess, is, it, is he also kind of alluding in this to what's going on on, on Palm Sunday? He's not. In this writing, it's clear he's writing to the Philippians in Philippi, right? But it sure kind of brings out this same feeling. And the thing that, um, that we need to remember, I think, when we go through this day of celebration is we, we need to remember Jesus. And we need to remember what it was really like for Jesus. Because what we do, particularly the American church... I've seen it different in the Latino church. I've talked about that, whatever. But particularly in the American church, we're just all about praise Jesus. We're saved. Hallelujah. Let's go home and watch Netflix. You know, that's kind of what we do. And we follow God. We, we have him in our minds. We, we try and be morally good people. And that's all really good. But I wonder how much you're working out your faith moment by moment with fear and trembling, with respect. The, the Jewish people say wisdom begins with the fear and admonition of the Lord. I don't think that we respect God at all as much as he deserves. And I say that with data because I see empty chairs. I see, I see people that are, have walked away from, from God. I see people that that say they're followers of God, but their lives don't, don't play that out. As a matter of fact, their lives may play out something very different. We saw some of that in the last election, right? People carrying around Bibles. And, and, and I think that is, is scary for me, but I think it should be scary for all of us 
Because what we're doing now is we're making decisions in our lives that we don't necessarily worry about how God feels about those decisions. And when we go to make those decisions, a lot of times those decisions are really difficult to make because they really challenge the world view we have and the way we're setting up our lives. That certainly has been the case over the last week since Carrie spoke, who's here again today, thanks Carrie, last week in like Kathy and I's lives and others' lives, where you step out on faith and make decisions and it's not easy, but you know that's what you're supposed to do. And I think what the American church, what, and to heck, you know, forget about the American church, let's just think about ourselves. What we need to regain in our lives, what I need to regain in my life is this working out of my salvation with fear and trembling, some more respect for God. When you read the Bible, you see it's constant respect for God. Constant, constant, constant respect for God. The worshiping of him, the, the slaughtering of those little lambs, everything that he commands while they're doing their own negative li lifestyles as well. But we just don't have that. It's not required of us to physically have that kind of response anymore. And I think it softened us. On the next slide here, I just pointed out a couple of things that I noticed that he's saying, Paul is also speaking to us in this room, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. The Apostle Paul died, in case you guys were wondering, and um, we're not in his presence anymore, right? And so I feel like it, right there when I read that, he's resonating directly to me because I'm trying to live out Paul's gospel of peace, this new dispensation that Jesus gave him in my life everywhere I can. Paul is teaching me even though he's gone, and I just have his writings to follow. And so what I, what I want to really encourage us this Palm Sunday, as Jesus walked up that dusty hill, actually, I guess he rode up on a donkey, but as he went up in there and he knew what was coming, he was continuing to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we need to do the same. We need to show God the awe and respect that he deserves, and we need to continue to work. Not slide, not glide, not whatever happens, not, not just, well, I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm good, but actually work on our salvation every day with fear and trembling. I know I do that for myself, and I hope you do that for yourself as well. And this kind of faith takes positioning, right? Because really what it boils down to is positioning yourself to be able to work out your faith with fear and trembling. You have to position yourself to have time to do that. You have to position yourself to answer the calls to do that, because God will call when you listen. And it's all about this positioning of working it out, working it out, working it out. Let's get back to that Hosanna moment in, in the... Um, Palm Sunday on this next slide. I wanted to show you what Hosanna means. So we, we talked about the verse up there. Hosanna, in my mind, is the cry of the Great Commission because it can mean praise or adoration, which it does in this passage. But for most of the Hebrew scriptures, most of the Old Testament, Hosanna is an appeal to God to be delivered from evil or enemies. So it's a cry like, Hosanna, like come help us, come save me. That's really the heart of the Hosanna message. And so they have taken this cry of come save me on Palm Sunday and they've moved it to like the one who they recognize can save them is Jesus Christ. And so it becomes in this moment less of an appeal to God for deliverance, but praise or adoration to Jesus for what he has done, which in turn fulfills the appeal to God for deliverance because it's through Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins through him that God has come and saved us as we cry Hosanna. But again, remember, Palm Sunday is this bittersweet experience of coming in in celebration, church, family, friends, 
you know, whatever it is for you, but it's also an understanding that there's work to be done that's coming and that we are to work that out with fear and trembling and we're to go out and reach the rest of the people. <clears throat> Now, I know a lot of you know that I have a missionary heart. Most of it, honestly, is just a selfish desire to travel the world. I love traveling. Um, and then I realized, wait, I can actually serve God by traveling. Hey, this is a win-win, right? It's positioning, right? And so I've gone out and done that with a lot of people. I bring teams along because it changes all of our lives. And it's not just the Scott Show, right? It's all of us learning together. And we just go out and we try and help people. Because we don't want to just go on vacation with Jesus, like it sounded like when I started this. Um, I love to travel the world. That's a, that's a feeling, I would call it a gift God has given me. Not everybody likes to travel like that, right? And there are scary moments when we've been out. Times where uh, one of our speakers today told me, hey, reach over into my glove box and get my gun. Um, you know, what? You know, so there are, there are moments, you know, that are scary. Ask my wife, <laughs> who's back home. And, um, and so there's a lot of work that you have to do as well. But it's what God has gifted me to do. And more importantly, I think why he's done this is, is to fulfill Hosanna. Because there's a lot of people out in the world that are yelling Hosanna. They may not be using that word, but they are, they are asking for God to deliver them. Deliver them from their children starving to death in their arms. You know, remember if you're older, the Ethiopian famines and all that stuff, how horrible that was. That goes on every day all around the world. I've seen some of it, and it's heartbreaking. You know, deliver us from this poverty. Um, how do we break this cycle? How do we educate our children so that they don't have to repeat this? How do we keep our daughters from being abused? How do we, you know, all this stuff going on out in the world... Because Satan is at work, too. It's not just God. And so when you go and do missionary work, it's like you're going out and you're answering the cry of Hosanna. That's why you're going. If you happen to like traveling and don't mind occasional, rare, but occasional danger, then that's just a plus. But you're really going to answer the cry of Hosanna coming out of the mouths of mothers and fathers and children all over the world. Today we're really blessed. We're actually kind of triple blessed today. Um, but uh, we're really blessed to have one of my favorite couples around. Um, we've done some work in El Salvador and um, we always get to stay at uh, this couple's house and it's magnificent. They do a lot of work there, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get ahead of things. But since they're here, and this was interesting, too. Again, you just paying attention, positioning yourself to listen to God. I get a phone call. Hey, I'm in country. We need to get together right now. <laughs> That's Pedro. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay. Hey, wait a minute. I'm doing, like, foreign missions on this Sunday, on Palm Sunday. Would you come attend and speak? You know, it's God kind of positioning everything. And so we do have Yvonne and Pedro and their grandson, Ryan, uh, here this morning. Hi, Ryan. And um, so I just thought I'd encourage them to come up and just ask them a couple of questions. So would you join me in welcoming Yvonne and Pedro and Ryan Ortiz? <laughs> Ryan, you can take any chair you want. So like I said, we've stayed at um, Yvonne and Pedro's house a lot in El Salvador. Pedro, we have a Salvadorian, this big scary looking dude right in front, Salvadorian. Emerson's his name. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. Um, that's food, by the way. Um, yeah, I like papusas too, yeah. And they're really good in El Salvador because they just make them and hand them to you or you make them yourself. But anyway, um, I've known Pedro and Yvonne for many years. They attend um, also Morello Hills Christian Church in Martinez and then they shipped off to be a mission, uh, missionaries. But Pedro's from El Salvador and always wanted to return back and um, give back to his country. And Yvonne has been gracious enough to be dragged along with him. And so um, we always pray for Yvonne because Pedro's a lot in a good way. <laughs> and, um, 
And it's just really good. But Pedro and Yvonne, I, really, I didn't get a chance to, let me get where you can see me. I didn't get a chance to really go over this with you because, you know, this week has been frantic. But the, what I really wanted to know, especially when you're thinking of the theme this morning with Palm Sunday, is why would you, how did you position yourself to hear the call of God to do this? And um, why do you do it? Uh before before I get to your answer, is uh, I want to go back to what Scott was mentioning. That is fun to go, and it's nice to be able to help people. But sometimes you put yourself in danger, and uh, he mentioned about the gun. Oh, <laughs> I kind of told on you. Sorry. And uh, it is true. I was with uh, seven, eight people that came and visited us. And uh, I took them to a place that even I don't know still, I still don't know where I was. And I thought they were taking us over there to be kidnapped. So I say, what am I gonna do with all these gringos over here? <laughs> and I say, where do I tell them to go in case something happened? So I didn't know what to do. I say, when the moment come, I tell them to run. I say, that's all I'm going to tell them. Run and hide yourself. But, you know, it is beautiful to be able to do that. Because after afterwards, you know, I was talking to Scott, and uh, I felt so relief. As did I. You know, and it was a moment also that the truck that we were driving stopped right in the middle of a river. Okay. And I say, man, if it, I don't get a start, this truck over here, what's going to happen? We're just going to fall. Okay. And, uh, but we made it. And uh, we're here and we're happy. But it's very, very challenging to be able to go out. And people sometimes think, you know, oh, they're just going on vacation. Oh, they're going to see a new country. It's, it's not like that, especially when you're not from there. And even so for myself, it is very dangerous. And uh, sometimes I go places that I would not dare to go by myself. Okay, and uh, they took me over there, and I went along with the ride, but it, very, very, very scary places. But they're also beautiful, beautiful places, okay? And uh, that's why Scott like to go over there, because it's more beautiful places than ugly places, so he can relax and have a good vacation, okay? Well, I don't, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, also... Yes. Yeah. Also about the pandemic, you know, we, I was a pastor beyond uh, Morello Hill Christian Church last Sunday, and I was talking to Pastor Bill. What he was saying is, I didn't like it. And I'm a man that always say, right in your face, if, if I believe that you're wrong, I tell you, and I don't care who you are, either you like it or not, I like to tell you how I feel about it. And I've been noticing, not only over here, but in El Salvador and in other places, that fear is conquering us. We, we are so much afraid about what can happen to us instead of celebrating that we are here together. I feel pain for many people and family and friends that are very close to us, that they lost members of their family month after month. One month was the sister, the next month was the brother, the following month was the brother-in-law. So I do know and I feel and I cry for them. But at the same time, 
I am very happy that it's more families that are still together without losing any member. And that's what I celebrate. And I encourage everybody to celebrate that. Being able to be here and feel the energy of all of you is wonderful. It's beautiful to be able to talk to you. It's beautiful. So I'm not going to let this joy be taken from me from the fear that they're trying to impose to us. Millions and millions and millions of people went out the streets to vote for the president. But we don't see millions and millions and millions of people going to church because they're afraid. But when they were voting, they were close one to each other it's many times. Me, thousands of people got together without a mask. And they were not afraid. And that's that fear and trembling part, you know, putting God first. You know, right? yeah. but when we come to church, we keep a social distance, we put a mask, and we are afraid that somebody is going to give it to us. And they're afraid that we might give it to them. I mean, it's okay to, you know, keep social distance and uh, be uh, aware of what can happen to us. But I'm not agree about letting fear to take over the love for God. So have you seen effects of, of uh, in El Salvador from what has happened here? I'm sorry? Have you seen effects in El Salvador that are related to the pandemic? Or what was your experience in El Salvador? Oh, that, that was time? horrible. I tell you, you guys, you know, feel, you know, over here, keep social distance and, and wearing a mask and having food in your plate and having electricity, having water, having transportation. You should see over there. We, with the help of all of you and Morello Hill Christian family, we were able to provide food for people, for families. Stay put. Excuse me. I have to do that. And I tell you something. Imagine a family of four or five or six to be able to survive a whole week with a $10 grocery bag. $10. Where you have a little bit of beans, a little bit of rice, corn, oil, salt, sugar, and that's it. And that's for a whole week. There was a man that hanged himself of frustration and not being able to fulfill the need of his family. So what, what gave you, like, what led you into doing this kind of work? Because you could just move back to a country you know, live in a really nice house, swim in your awesome pool that I've swam in. Why do you go out and do this stuff? It just, you know, it, 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 I don't feel good if I eat and I see you're hungry. Yeah. I don't. I, I, I just, it just, um, us, because Yvonne is the same way. We have people that we invite to eat at our table whenever it's possible, they're workers. We give them food, and when we go on the street and you see the poverty level mm -hmm. that they live in, in, and you saw it, it's pitiful, it's pitiful. 
We're talking about poverty level over here. And all you have to do is extend your hand and it's lots of food, clothing. And if the cops see you in the street, they're sleeping in the street, they take you from there and they take you to a shelter. Over there, the police see you and they ignore you because nothing they can do about it. Yeah. Nothing they can do about it. People was with white flags in the street. But I, you're talking about blocks and blocks of people with a white flag. And the meaning of that white flag was, I need help. We need food. And they don't ask you for a piece of meat. They don't ask, if you give them a sack of beans and rice, they'll be happy. They're not demanding to have, you know, prime rib or cheese or crackers. They just want corn. They plant the corn seed. They get the new corn. They dry it. And they made tortillas. 14 people, 14 people was working in Annabella's house. An old lady that we were building a little house for her. Go sit down at, at the chair, please. Please. 14 people. It is close to lunchtime. And they say, hey, Pedrito, they call me Pedrito. I say, it's almost lunch time. Are you going to give us, you know, lunch? And I say, okay. And I figure, you know, 14 people, $5 each is $70, okay? And then I say, how much money you need? And uh, she say, $5. And I say, $5? She said, yeah, we're going to buy $3 in tortillas, $1 in beans, $1 in rice to feed 14 people with $5. Yeah. A house that we were building for an old man, I decide that, hey, this guy is very special, and I'm going to buy rotisserie chickens to celebrate. So we bought about six or seven rotisserie chickens, bread and sodas. And you know, it's, it's unbelievable. What they did, they split the chickens in equal parts, but they didn't eat it. They didn't eat it. They wrap it up and they took it with them so they can share with their family. So all that is what make me feel good when I go out. Yeah. And I being able to help them, you know, with whatever they need, that make me happy. And I go back home and I, I'm very satisfied, very happy, I like it, okay? Uh, Yvonne doesn't like too much for me to go out because she say I'm too old and uh, I might get it, you know, easier. And uh, we have a very dear friend, which is the one that uh, at the beginning, you know, took us into these different roles and places, Bl Blanquita. Blanquita. Yeah. And this woman goes to wherever you know they need something and you're never going to see her wearing a mask. Never. She does. And we get mad at her. We get mad at her, you know, and I, I say, don't do that. And she keep telling me, yes, yes, I'm not going to do it. And she hugged people, and uh, people hug her in places that is no water, no bathrooms, no nothing, just a shock. So what kind of hygiene, you know, must be there? 
And she don't care. She doesn't care. And she's alive. Yeah. And she's, she never failed to go to church. Every week she go to church. Okay. Yeah, Miss Blanquita, so she is also running for office, uh, mayor of this district. Um, they just tried to assassinate her, actually, um, yeah. and were unsuccessful. But she is a woman that's just always, she really believes in, in serving her people in that La Libertad is, a, is the area of El Salvador. And um, she is, she's out seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, I've sat across a lunch table with her and had her crying from fatigue. I mean, it's just incredible stuff going on over there. And I don't want to cut you short, Pedro, other than for time. But yes. I know your heart has always been, um, I think what makes you unique as a missionary is you have a heart for serving people that's 100%. And you just have the drive and determination and, frankly, machismo to just make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's been a, I just see that as a powerhouse for you, and I so appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, Thank always, you. always, yeah. and for letting us be that. We've supported Pedro and Yvonne uh, by sending them money for these $10 bags of food that they often buy at grocery stores or, or markets and distribute out. We've gone out on uh, mission trips. Um, we were hoping to head out on one um, last year and didn't didn't happen because of COVID. We're still trying to figure that out. But I do encourage you, especially you younger people, but all of us, if there if you are interested, you know, fill out a, a little uh, one of those contact cards or a piece of paper, or whatever, pictures, words of encouragement, anything for Pedro or Yvonne. Yvonne puts up with a lot because she puts up with Pedro and, um, <laughs> and um, you know, or just some of the kids that are down there, maybe a picture that you'd want to pass on to one of the, him to pass on to one of the kids down there and we'll, we'll come collect them uh, towards the end of this service. But right now I just wanted to, if I could just pray for you guys real quick. Um, let me find my darn mask now that I'm getting close to you. Cause you know, you live down in El Salvador. I don't really know what's going to happen here. Was that germ? Latino germs. <laughs> Latino germs. All right, I'm safe then. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father God, we just uh, I thank you for both uh, Yvonne and Pedro, for their hearts, for their determination, for their drive, not just um, a worldview for themselves, but a worldview for your people. And just pray that you continue to protect them and encourage them, energize them, and uh, help their ministry continue uh, moving forward in effectiveness for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So one year when we were, uh, oh, you got it going, John. Uh, I, somehow I messed up this picture, but this was the team that we went um, to El Salvador. We're actually standing up on the top of a dormant volcano. But um, and you can see Pedro and Yvonne in the background here. This guy squatting down with a hat on um, is our other missionary for today. So his name is Austin Holland, and we know him, Pedro and Yvonne and I know him really, and Kathy, well, from Morello Hills Christian Church, where we came from to serve here. And um, he's been their tech guy. He's been their Michael Belechi, basically, at Morello Hills. Um, he grew up as a, as a little boy in that church and has gone on. But when we were in El Salvador and um, also on another trip in Guatemala, he felt God's call on his heart to leave his good job here, his apartment here, all his worldly possessions, because you can't take it with you, <laughs> and, um, and everything that he knows and go serve in Guatemala where we served one year. Um, we served children in Guatemala. And so uh, he started that in November of this last year, and he's, just, he's still there. Actually, one of the things I didn't know that was a secret was one of the reasons, I'm sure it's not one of the reasons why he's there, but he met uh, one of the female workers down there when we were there, and somehow, secretly, they sparked a little romance, and she, her family lives in Washington State, and so when she came back on missionary, I always call it parole, but that's not it. Um, when, when, you, when you come back for a week or a month or whatever, you just, you know, kind of rest for a minute because as you're going to see in a minute, missionaries are exhausted too. He flew up, they ended up getting engaged and he's going to get married to her um, this March. But 
he did, he did want to send a video down um, for us. Uh, Morello Hills, as part of our missionary giving, we're trying to increase our missionary giving up to about 10% slowly in little baby steps each year. And so this year, our increase, that's why it's hard to breathe. This year, our increase is um, we decided to support Austin because it's not much that we are able to offer, right? We're a small congregation. Um, and so we're just doing this out of our, uh, out of your offerings. And um, so we're supporting him too. He's a restoration guy because he's from Morello Hills, which is a restoration church. He was born and raised in that. And although he's not working for a restoration agency, um, it's just fascinating that I led a team down to Guatemala one year. He was part of that team. He's been to Nicaragua with me in El Salvador as well. And um, God touched his heart. And here's what he did. So let's show you this video he sent us. Yeah, no worries. We have had, um, this is part of the missionary thing too, so it's kind of appropriate, but we've had a lot of glitches with uh, the, the PowerPoint I sent this week. So um, one thing to know is you've got to imagine, um, just put yourself in his feet. I'll just talk until this starts, but put yourself in his feet. Like you have your life right now. Maybe you're single. That would make it easier. Maybe you're married. And then all of a sudden you feel a call from God to leave everything and you go. And that's what he's had to do is he'll say he spends uh, four days a week, four hours a day learning Spanish. He doesn't even speak Spanish. They speak in Shela, which is Quetzaltenango in, in uh, western Guatemala where we served. And uh, so he's having to learn everything. He's all on his own. Um, he's electronics. He's a tech guy, so he can, you know, message us back and forth. He can uh, text me back and forth. We text a lot. I'm trying to, like, keep his, you know, keep his spirits going as well, though he doesn't need it. He's pretty great at this. Um, but it's so weird. But they don't even get mail there. Like, okay, all of you fellow Amazon addicts, um, you can't even get Amazon there. It's ridiculous. It's primitive. Um, but you can't even get a letter. You can't get, a, you can't get nothing. They have no postal service at all in Guatemala. You have to drive four hours east to Guatemala City and pick something up. And so he's just absolutely, completely cut off. What's that, Yvonne? Oh, we can't do it in El Salvador. What? So do you just come here and stock up on Amazon and then go home? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, he's watching. Oh, right on. Right on. I was hoping. He... Oh, good. So, uh, Austin, since Barry's watching, uh, what's the weather like in Guatemala? We're stalling till your video comes on. Maybe he'll answer. And then, how's Carly? And Amelia, did you have a question for him? What's your question? Are we done yet? We're so close, Amelia. We're so close. I know. This is going a little long today. It's been, yes. Whoa. <laughs> Ryan, you had a question. We don't have children's class here. We just make you be bored and sit in here. It's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, here comes the video. Yeah, it's getting warmer. There. It's getting warmer. All right. So weird technology, right? He's listening from Guatemala. Hey, everyone. My name's Austin. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, more specifically the Martinez Concord area. I uh, grew up going to Morello Hills Christian Church. It's located in Martinez. To give you a little more background, I found out about Interchange and the team here in Shela about three years ago when I visited with a group from my church. Ever since the trip, I felt the Holy Spirit draw me back to learn more about the ministry here. I was always impacted by the short-term mission trips that I did. So I decided to commit to Interchange for three years and explore my ministry calling further. Uh, I'm currently located in the city of Shela, which is located in the country of Guatemala. It's about a three to four hour drive north, northwest of Guatemala City. It's also the second largest city in Guatemala. I'm currently working with a group called Interchange. They have teams all over the world. Our teams are relational and incarnational in nature meaning we move into the communities we serve. Our goal is to share the gospel with those marginalized by society. In our case, here in Guatemala, we work with families who may not have enough money to support their children's education, which is how our tutoring and scholarship program started. 
The mission statement's very detailed and more of that can be found on the website on the screen now. As I said earlier, I'm located in the city of Shewa, which is about a three to four hour drive from Guatemala City. It's on the western side of the country. Uh, the whole country itself is surrounded by Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, and Mexico. Uh, the area I work in is kind of a more historic area of Shela. There's a lot of um, old buildings, old roads, a lot of the roads are made out of stone or rock, uh, gravel, um, cement, uh, dirt. There's all kinds of different styles, so it takes a little getting used to when you're walking around out there uh, so you don't uh, sprain your ankle or something like that. At the time of this recording, I've now been here for about four and a half months. I started in November of 2020. Um, my job right now is to learn Spanish. I need to go and do that before I can really fully work with the team. Right now I'm doing that four hours a day, four days a week with a teacher one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we do a lot of conversational teaching, which is really helpful for me. Uh, without this, it's kind of very difficult um, to work with the community and the team members because everything's done in Spanish. Um, the uh, culture is another thing I have to learn. A lot of the things I've learned so far are things like people here are very welcoming. There's normally multiple generations living in one house. Um, a lot of the other things I'm trying to do right now is understand the history, what they do for their daily lives, um, some of the differences and similarities with the United States. Um, also, the thing I've I've noticed uh, while walking around the parks and stuff is a lot of the kids work with the parents and other family members at a very young age to help raise money for their family. So you see a lot of kids in the parks and on the streets selling things. Normally when you come here for the first time and you're learning the language and culture, typically it takes around six to eight months depending on the person. Um, Right now, besides doing the language stuff, I'm also working with the team and the kids on computer technology stuff, uh, doing audio and video stuff. Um, I spent many years in the States doing these things. And so I get a chance to use some of my skills um, to help out uh, when, I, when I can. Um, I also love playing music. I play the guitar quite a bit, so I get, um, I'm get. i hoping to get a chance soon to kind of play with some of the team members and some of the community. One of the other things I'm currently in the process of doing is um, getting ready to get married. Um, my fiance, Carly, is also a team member here, and we're planning on getting married in June, which is about uh, a little under three months away now. She's from the Washington State area. She's in her fourth year now. So a little bit more about the team members that I work with. Like I said earlier, we're a team of about 10 people. Six are from here in Guatemala and four are from the States. Um, the kids we work with typically range in age of six to high school age, um, but mostly we work with elementary age kids. Uh, we also work with the families and a lot with the mothers doing Bible studies and other types of meetings and get togethers uh, as well as retreats. Um, due to COVID though, we've had to do a lot of changes lately. So we're working on. Whoa, it's, oh, it's coming out of speaker. So Austin, sorry, Austin did post three more minutes, but I'm holding you guys up a lot already too. Um, but yeah, Austin, first of all, you look really, really tired. So you need to get some rest, my friend. <laughs> and I'm sorry I couldn't get you at the airport this time when you flew through, that broke my heart. But anyway, um, yeah, so Austin is online on our feed right now. So maybe you might wanna go online and just send him a little electronic note of encouragement. But thank you for putting that together, Austin. I'm. I know it was a crazy week for you, and I see you're sitting on the edge of your bed at night trying to uh, video for us, and we really appreciate you for that. Um, I did want to mention a couple of the other uh, missionaries that we support. I think it's uh, back up, John or Michael, in the PowerPoint. First Christian Church supports Holland, or uh, Holland, Austin Holland, as you, as you heard. We also indirectly support uh, Pedro and Yvonne. They're working on getting a nonprofit company started down there, and we'll be able to more directly help them as well in the future. We also uh, help the Tijuana Christian Mission in Tijuana, which caters mostly to children. And uh, Arnie Swan, I put Ernie on my slides, but uh, he caught it. So that's Barry's brother in India serving um, in there. Thank you very much. 
I put Ernie. I, I apologize, Ernie, if you're watching. Uh, and then the, I'm focused on children, so I notice I put Tijuana Children's instead of Tijuana Christian, and it's actually Korean gospel something, Christian mission. So I just focus on children. I love kids. Um, and they're in South Korea, and they try and do, they've done things like they've, uh, the leaders there have come out of William Jessup University when it was San Jose Bible College. Um, John, one of the guys that's at that mission, hi, John, if you're watching, he, um, he and I will swap emails every so often. It's really kind of fun to know I'm talking to someone in South Korea. Um, and they try and do radio broadcasts that reach into Korea, right? Just are reaching over the border in the airwaves. And then I want to keep bringing this other thing up, which is other private congregant supports, which means there's many of us in this room and online that are supporting other missionaries as well as part of our, our faith life as we're living it out. And so um, that's, what, uh, that's what First Christian... Or- yeah, First Christian um, does, basically. I'm going to blast through this last little passage, and, and I want you to think about what you've heard and seen this morning. I want you to think about Jesus going into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday and seeing the celebration, but also weeping and heading towards the Garden of Gethsemane where he's crying blood, heading towards the torture, the cross, the death, the resurrection, heading towards... Um, Father, Father, uh, why have you abandoned me on the cross? These kinds of things, right? So he's, he's working out your and my salvation with fear and trembling. And I want you to think about Pedro and, and Yvonne when, when they're just basically pouring out themselves, their lives, parts of their lives in El Salvador where they live. And Austin definitely also pouring out his, in, giving up his life, very successful life here in the States, to pour out to the Lord his life as well. And then just think about all of these things in the sense of are we working out our own individual individual face with fear and trembling like this. This passage out of Philippians, um, I wanted to read to you this morning. Is that crash still, Michael? Because I can just read it. Oh, or I could look. Um, Really, and this is actually, you know, where, I, where we talked about that passage in Philippians 2.12, where we mentioned the working out our faith with fear and trembling. These are the verses that follow directly after. Uh, well, this is the verse actually of it. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Next slide. For it is God who works in you, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. When you're on the mission field, one of the first things you have to teach everybody is this is going to be hard. And we're here for each other. We're, we're not going to do any infighting, any drama, any grumbling. That's why I like to take adults. Um, we're not doing any of that stuff, right? We're here for each other, and we have to be here for each other to keep each other safe. But it's going to be hard, and you're going to grumble, and you're going to complain, and so am I. And you also have to know missionary work is all whatever you wake up the next morning and the Lord provides for you to do because you'll always go in with plans and they will never be what you end up doing that day, right? Next slide. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. This is what Pedro and Yvonne face a lot in El Salvador, and then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. These are the things that Paul is saying that make us become blameless and pure, is working out our faith with fear and trembling for other people. And then when we do that, we become something different, or we should be something different in this world. Carrie and her Daughters of the King house is trying to pour out herself and her ministry and just so she can do something not for herself, trust me, you heard that last week if you listen. It's for single moms that are, have children and are about to become homeless. It's finding a call that God has placed on your life and answering it. And it may just simply be something basic and easy. But often what I find is it's something that's a little hard, a little big, but is in an area where God has made you interested. We call it, when we're in church, we call it all churchy spiritual gifts, and that's true. But also just your natural interests. I like to travel. I don't mind a little danger. 
I just don't tell my wife. And, um, and so I go on these mission trips because that fulfills all of that. Maybe you love little kids. Maybe you love uh, elderly people. Maybe you, you know, there's just a million ways to fulfill the Great Commission. As you hold firmly to the word of life, then I will be able, that's Paul, I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When we, when we just come to church or watch it online and we don't do anything with it, we've, it's like if Jesus had just walked into the gates of Jerusalem like, yep, I'm the guy. You know, Hosanna, welcome is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Big giant praise. Jesus could have walked in and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then if he had not gone to the cross, that would mean nothing to you and me. We would still be trapped in our sins with no temple now, thanks to the Romans, to go slaughter animals at and no desire to do that. So our, that work of Jesus would have been meaningless without the outcome, without him facing even what he gives us a glimpse of, his fears, his trembling, his crying until he's crying tears of blood in the garden, his, his torture, right? His crucifixion, his resurrection. He had to go all through that. If he hadn't have done that, we would not be here. You would not be saved. And so what about everyone and everything out there in that same boat that you have the opportunity to bring Jesus to? It's not you. You're not going to save anybody. I'm not going to save anybody. But I can bring them to salvation, the work of the cross. And that's why our cross is empty, because the work's been done. Next slide. Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I'm going to just take one self, what do you call that? Self like, hey, hey, look at me moment. Pastoring is difficult. I just had a crazy, crazy week and it was absolutely wonderful. But I did hear this, and this is why I chose this passage. I, he, I did, I have to pour out my life to do this. I have to. Because I don't want to just be someone standing up here giving you some words and then go and live in a uh, life that's good for me. I have to pour out my life. When I go to El Salvador, uh, you know, we're going on our dimes. I have to pour out my life. I have to be willing to give up my life. These things aren't easy. But the most effective and the most amazing part of being a man of faith or a woman of faith is once you start pouring yourself out for Christ instead of yourself, the world becomes bigger and more beautiful and more clearly filled with purpose. There are so many people out there that have such a negative view of this world or where it's going that I don't necessarily agree with. I think if you, I've said this several times this week to people, if you Google, is the world getting better or worse, it's clearly getting better, believe it or not. Crime rates are way, way, way down. Poverty, well, until COVID hit, was way, way, way down. You know, there's beauty in the world. When you walk out these doors this morning, you live in a beautiful area here. We had someone visiting, oh, it was Jonathan, our, our daughter's uh, boyfriend from Maryland, and he commented, like, the Bay Area is like, you're living in Hawaii almost. It's so beautiful here, right? And so there's a lot of beauty in the world too. But there's a lot of hurt out there. There's a lot of homeless people out there. There's a lot of abused people out there. There's a lot of addicted people out there. There's a lot of people right on the edge of taking their lives. And we need to be pouring ourselves out like Jesus poured himself out. And the truth is, you will never feel your faith until you start pouring yourself out. It's just a weird thing that happens. Oh, good. <laughs> I got to the end. Sorry. Uh, I get so wrapped up sometimes. The harvest, uh, this is actually from last week. I just tweaked it a little bit. But to remember the harvest, the people that are ripe for salvation, to be brought to the cross, right? To be 
harvested. I just don't like that term. But the, labor, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The truth is most people in church this morning all over the globe aren't doing any harvesting. They're just walking in the fields. The laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest and start with yourself, I would add. Be kingdom generous with your time, with your talents. Tithes isn't really, as someone pointed out to me this week, isn't really even a New Testament term. It's more your offerings, right? Um, we're not commanded to tithe in the New Testament. We're commanded actually to give more, to give offerings, you know. Uh, but it's also your talents and your time. There's a lot of weeds that need to be pulled. There's a lot of cleaning that I guess could be done. There's a lot. We're going to meet after church today, some of the parents and I, and talk about children's ministry. There's just a lot that could always be done to, to help serve the world more. And your time is required to do that. Consider supporting a missionary. Consider some missionary that you know or heard of or come talk to me or whatever that maybe you support five dollars if you go over to austin's page you can sign up for any amount so if he touched you you could go over there and say i'm going to send austin five dollars a month i'm not even going to feel that you know that's great and he put of course he did he put his link on the uh, good job austin good job <laughs> And so, uh, you know, but if 10 of us sent him $5 or hopefully 10 of us sent him $25, you know, or whatever it is, that would really go a long way to help him. Kathy and I personally support him. Um, but anybody, it may be a family friend of yours. It may be Arnie because you met him once with Barry. It, it, anybody that's out there pushing the word, uh, the gospel forward who needs funding, get involved and help them with your time, your talent or your ties. And get involved with First Christian Church missions. We're forming a missionary team. Right now it's me and Emerson. Uh, <laughs> and we haven't done anything. But, uh, but, you know, as we move forward, what are the next missionaries we want to take on? What are the missionaries that we currently have that we want to increase our support? And sometimes what missionaries aren't, aren't really a partner of us anymore? It's a lot to manage. Um, and we would love to manage it together instead of just me and, in this case, Emerson, me and Emerson making all the choices because we're just going to go to El Salvador, which I'm sure Pedro and Yvonne would be great. But, um, yeah, we need, I'd love for more people to come on board and say, yeah, I would just attend a Zoom meeting with you guys or whatever. It's not much effort. But anywhere you can get involved. All right. So this is uh, Palm Sunday. And thank you for being here. I know it was a crazy, mixed, and long message. I knew it would be because it's missionary work. It gets messy. Next week, we'll be here for Easter. I encourage you guys all to be here next week. Um, and anybody online that feels safe to be here, to be here next week as we celebrate um, the Lord's resurrection. And throughout this week, one way that you can start pouring yourself out, and this is going to be really challenging for me, so don't think I'm any different here, is this is Holy Week. Like Carrie pointed that out to me this morning, she's got a Daughters of the King house um, set up uh, that she just got a lease for during Holy Week. And I was like, oh yeah, it's Holy Week because I'm just so focused on everything that's going on, right? And so what does Holy Week mean to you? What does Monday Thursday, when, when they celebrated, that's actually the evening that uh, Jesus took um, the Last Supper. Um, what does Passover mean? Do you know anything about Passover? What about Friday when he was being tortured and then crucified, how will you commemorate that? Uh, what about what I call the day the earth stood still, Saturday, that day between his crucifixion and his rising again, where there was no earthly Jesus? What will you do then? And what about Sunday, the most important day of a Christian's life? Because many people have said, that they could not die or they would die and they would resurrect as gods or whatever and only one person pulled that off so we should probably listen to that guy and his name is jesus christ let me pray father god i just thank you for this day thank you for pedro and yvonne and their lives and um, thank you for austin and carly and the whole team down there in guatemala um, we pray for you guys often as well Thank you for the, the hearts and the spirits of the people gathered here today in person and online. I just pray that you would continue to encourage us to pour ourselves out for you, Father. Maybe to just start pouring ourselves out for you. 
Encourage us all through this week. I just beg you, Father, remind us to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling, with respect for you. And maybe identify ways where we've stopped doing that. Start making you and yours a priority in ourselves. We just love you, Jesus. We love you so much for um, doing this, for walking into Jerusalem and being uh, carrying out your cross a few days later and resurrecting. We look forward to celebrating that um, next week. And we just, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys have a great Holy Week.